I know that we're, we've come to label the events of 2013, 2014 as the Euromaidan. And that's an interesting fact, but it's Euromaidan in the West. Uh, very few people actually in Ukraine call it the Euromaidan anymore. Uh, because Euromaidan basically ended December 1st. Euromaidan was something that was very, very short-lived. It was a student movement, primarily student. I'm, I'm referencing something that, that Lubko Markevich talked about yesterday. Um, the students became basically marginalized after December 1st. And the whole idea of Europe, effectively, was used as a symbol for something, but the revolution was, effect was much more of a national awakening than a movement towards Europe. And I think that's an important, um, an important aspect. Um, this idea of dignity is very important, and it's a dignity of belonging. So in, in Ukraine, we call it revolution of dignity, uh, and much less so Euromaidan. It, it would be difficult to call these people bourgeois or even petty bourgeois. Um, this is a very large, large number of unemployed people. Um, the value, however, the values that the Maidan as a social actor stood for, and the con economic and political reforms that its activists lobbied in the wake of the collapse of the Yanukovych regime approximated those generally associated with the bourgeoisie. So, self-reliance, highly limited government, entrepreneurial freedom, espousal of meritocracy. Indeed, it was this bourgeoisie that allowed its employees to leave their jobs to demonstrate on Independence Square during their working hours. And it was this bourgeoisie that financed much of the supply effort for Maidan and for the ensuing Russia-Ukraine war. It was this bourgeoisie that formed the heart of the Avto Maidan and very a very effective cavalry force of protesters who would picket the homes of regime representatives in their mid-range and upscale passenger vehicles. And my final point, um, the postmodern dimension. Uh, what we see is the formation of new senses. And Ukraine's Maidan throughout its sort of active period of 94 days was not merely about protest. Nominally barricaded from the outside world, Independence Square became a pace for intellectual exchange, for the formation of new senses, their discussion, acceptance, rejection, and popularization. It was a place where new paradigms were constructed, molded, and engendered in discourse, symbols, and other communicative ar artifacts. Amidst the protesters' tents, barricades, facing police lines, speeches from the stage, songs and poetry heard in unlikely places, and never-ending negotiations between the opposition party leaders and the regime, people's value systems changed. The terminology used in their conversations transformed. The symbols that they used to express themselves began to morph. The Maidan was a collective social actor that spoke in multiple voices, none of which was really in sync with any group within Kiev's political elite. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this discourse transformation and its instantiation in new cooperative practicism was the very name given to the protests, the revolution of dignity. Dignity is a concept that has its roots in the Western European Enlightenment, and it's often viewed as an extension of the concept of individual rights. This is where I, I perhaps would, would have a discussion with Bodan Kordan today. Fundamental to the paradigm of Western liberal democracy and indeed to the modern concept of socio-political project of the past four centuries of Western civilization is this idea of the sanctity or the centrality of the individual. The concept of dignity as expressed on the Maidan was distinctly di different. The dignity of the Maidan, the word hidnist in Ukrainian is more emotionally charged than its equivalent in English, has a cooperative concept, a notion implying mutual aid obligations, uh, mutual trust, mutual respect. I was struck by the, well, in contrast, dignity is a concept that can only be actualized through active relational interdependence, in contrast to individualism. In order to have dignity, an individual must be recognized as having it by another. The topic of my presentation is interpreting the Maidan. I'll be talking a little less the implications of the Maidan um, and sort of I think that, that Taras did a, a fantastic job of, of, of looking at some of the things of, that, that are under Let's let's say under the uh, under the surface with respect to um, to the Donbas and Crimea, um, I'll, I'll interpret things at a little bit more of a top top down um, or 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 if you like um, high level 
uh, perhaps a little bit more theoretical level. Um, I'm interpreting the Maidan as a triple revolution. Now, the idea here is to try to, 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 to deal with some complexity. Um, the issue is that, that as, as with many revolutions, um, Maidan is, is a complex, very complex um, event. Uh, revolutions usually involve violence. They inevitably lead to circulation of a state's political elite. And sometimes, as in the case of what we call great revolutions, um, they contribute to broader social changes that encompass uh, a much wider geography and time scale that wouldn't be expected from a sort of a momentary political upheaval. I contend that Ukraine's Maidan was just such a great revolution, great being in quotation marks, if you like, um, comparable in effect to the American, the French, and the Russian revolutions before it. Um, but as with the case of these other civilization-forming events, Maidan's complexities are yet to be understood. So. Complexity and multidimensionality is not new to Ukraine analysts. Um, if we look at some of the literature of the, year of, of, of the 1990s, we have Klaus Offe, who first talked about the uh, transitions or the transformations that were ongoing in the late, late 1989 and, uh, and into the 90s in Central Europe, and he called them a triple, a triple transition. And then Taras, um, who, who, who was a speaker today, um, added to that in 2001. He said, no, wait a minute, in the Ukrainian case, we have a fourth uh, a fourth transition happening. Um, so in the first three cases, we've had state building, democratization, and marketization being three processes that happened in Central Europe and also in the former USSR. And in the Ukrainian case, as with several other uh, former Soviet republics, we have a fourth process of nation building. Now, I would contend, although this is not the, pro the, the, the topic of, of the paper today, that the first three, meaning state building, democratization, and marketization, were basically under, had, had, I mean, over the last 25 years, uh, a process has happened in Ukraine um, that effectively was hijacked. It was hijacked by the, uh, by the Yanukovych regime. Um, it was, there was an attempt to hijack it under Kuchma. Um, it was to some extent hijacked also uh, under, under Yushchenko, probably less so. Um, this process is very well, in my opinion, um, uh, described if someone's interested in it. Uh, Andrew Wilson has a book called Virtual Politics, um, and, and, and I really recommend it. It's, it talks about the role of political technologists. But the fourth process, which Taras uh, Kuzio uh, identified as being key to, uh, to understanding what was going on in the 90s and the 2000s in Ukraine, um, is this process of nation building. And certainly nation building is, is one of the aspects of what happened on the Maidan, and I would actually interpret that as the Maidan as being a sort of a culmination of this process. So what I'm doing is I'm viewing revolutionary events through very much an idealist rather than a structural lens. Um, so as I've written in several of my dispatches from Kyiv, I believe that if we're going to understand Maidan, we better be reading more Hannah Arendt and less Theta Scotchpole. The state of Scotch Pole is someone who's very much a, a structuralist when it comes to, uh, to revolutions. Hannah Arendt is someone that talked about the American and the French Revolution as being, if you like, civilization-forming events and idealist, in other words, uh, events that, 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 had, uh, that became great because of the fact that they produced new senses for, for, um, for the world and not just for their own countries. So in terms of my threefold, um, threefold framework that I'm presenting here today, the national dimension uh, is, in, in Arendt's terms, would be uh, completion or adjustment of a, of a historical trajectory, or at least that is what very often it was, it was f let's put it this way, it felt like that on the Maidan. And this is something that Arendt talks about a lot is, is um, first of all, if you're going to understand revolutions, you're going to need to understand what it feels like to be a revolutionary, what these people believed on the Maidan, and very much sort of this idea of completion of a nation-building project, or if you like, the adjustment of a, of a trajectory that had gone wrong uh, is something that, that, that certainly I felt, and I think many others did as well. The other one is also the transition inflection point for political development, and I call this the bourgeois dimension. I'll explain that why I'm using the term bourgeois. I know it's, it's, it's problematic, um, but it even, even more problematic would be the, the third term that I'm using, and that's postmodern. Um, because certainly bourgeois and postmodern are both labels that, have, that, that, that are, are variously uh, interpreted. Uh, but certainly the, post, the postmodern dimension is probably the most interesting to me. So, um, moving on. Uh, each of these dimensions I'm going to try to, to, uh, to deal with in turn. Uh, at during this uh, during this presentation, um, I'm going to start with the national dimension. We've talked about this quite a bit at this at this symposium, so this will be a little bit of review, and I apologize for that. 
um, but I will try to add uh, something new to that dimension as well. Um, I think there was a very interesting uh, phrase that came up very recently, and that was that uh, in searching for Europe, we found Ukraine. Uh, I'm personally, and, and I apologize for, for making this statement to the organizers, but I know that we're, we've come to label the events of 2013, 2014 as the Euromaidan. And that's an interesting fact, but it's Euromaidan in the West. Uh, very few people actually in Ukraine call it the Euromaidan anymore. Uh, because Euromaidan basically ended December 1st. Euromaidan was something that was very, very short-lived. It was a student movement, primarily student. I'm, I'm referencing something that, that Luke Markevich talked about yesterday. Um, the students became basically marginalized after December 1st. And the whole idea of Europe, effectively, was used as a symbol for something. But the revolution was, effect was much more of a national awakening than a movement towards Europe. And I think that's an important, um, an important aspect. Um, this idea of dignity is very important, and it's a dignity of belonging. So in, in Ukraine, we call it revolution of dignity, uh, and much less so on the, on the Maidan, on, of um, Euromaidan. Um, we have crucial importance of symbolism. And this is something that I guess references also the postmodern aspect, but it definitely references the idea of the Maidan as an idealist, or if you're going to understand the Maidan, you're going to have to take a, a, an idealist lens as opposed to looking really at, at, at structures and, 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 uh, and economics and, and perhaps more, more traditional political science. Um, as a participant, well, actually, I'll say, I'll say a couple things on the anthem, first of all. Um, I have this in the paper, and I'll, and I'll, I'll repeat it. Um, Ode to Joy, which is the EU anthem, in the entire period of the Maidan, I think I heard it two or three times. Uh, the Ukrainian national anthem was sung ad nauseum uh, in the subway, uh, while, fighting pro while fighting police, while not fighting police, from the stage, behind the stage, uh, you, just, you sang the national anthem. Um, as a participant in the protest, my, my explanation for the use of the red and black flag uh, it varies a little bit from uh, from what we've seen in, in the uh, in the uh, in, in the literature so far and, and in many many reports. I'll say that my interpretation is: look, the, the regime co-opted blue and yellow. Yanukovych was always in front of the TV screens with a blue and yellow flag behind him. It would have been illogical for the protesters to also be wearing blue and yellow because they are anti-regime. So what happened was that the red and black very often was used as a as a as a protest flag, as opposed to having an awful lot of historical significance. Um, a similar misunderstanding, or perhaps ma deliberate manipulation, occurred on the anti-Maidan side, which adopted the orange and black St. George's ribbon as its symbol, which, although according to popular discourse, this ribbon was supposed to symbolize Soviet victory in World War II, which I guess is a sort of a Russian and Ukrainian joint endeavor, uh, in fact, the colors date back to the Order of St. George medal established under uh, Imperial Russia in 1769. The use uh, to represent continuity between the Soviet Union and modern Russian Federation and the unity of Pan-Slavism is in fact a very much a post-Soviet phenomenon. Uh, I think I should probably say a couple words on the Cossack siege. Uh, Maidan was steeped in historical symbols that were actively reinterpreted by the demonstrators to reflect contemporary discursive needs. The very layout of the protest camp was infused with symbolic significance. Barricades, a church at the center of a fortified enclosure, spontaneous cooperation, self-sufficiency, individual and collective patience in the face of extreme hardship. The parallel between the Maidan and the siege of the 16th and 18th centuries, Cossack period, um, was difficult to miss. The lack of hierarchy, temporary nature of the leadership of the Maidan seemed to replicate the siege as did the motivations for many of those who camped on Independence Square during the freezing winter months, as many romantics on the Maidan never tried, tired of repeating. For the Cossacks, the siege was a place to find justice and to have one's dignity recognized by one's peers. And in case anyone missed the message, the phrase Maidan se siege, Maidan is siege, was proclaimed from the stage regularly. Inclusive patriotism rather than ethno-nationalism. I think this was talked about a lot during the uh, during the previous sessions, and, and certainly to this audience, I think I'm probably preaching to the to the choir. 
when I'm saying that the type of nationalism that we saw on Maidan is very much an inclusive form, and I, I'm not going to really go into that except to say that, that there's a lot of, of misconception with respect to the, the, the differentiation between nationalism and patriotism, and certainly the type of patriotism that emerged from the Maidan, and we see it in things like, for example, the fact that the first Euromaidan protests were sparked by a Facebook post. By the way, the author was Mustafa Nayem, not a very typical Ukrainian name. Um, the, uh, the the first the first uh, people who died um, on uh, on Hrushchevsko Street were Serhiy Nigoyan, who's an ethnic Armenian, and Mikhail Lozhesnevsky, who's an ethnic Belarusian. Um, the the after the Maidan was over, one of the first things that happened was the co-opt co-option of, of of people that were Jewish into the government. We had Jewish uh, uh, battalions in the self-defense, Maidan self-defense forces. Uh, I have pictures of people walking around in yarmulkes and right sector armbands. Um, it's it's it, to talk about the Maidan being very much a sort of an ethno-nationalist um, uh, concept is 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 to miss the point. Um, I think that there's a lot of romanticism in the Maidan, and certainly the national aspect, this idea of a, of a birth of a nation, is very much uh, steeped in romanticism. I'll quote a little bit from, um, uh, from Katya Horchinska, who is uh, the deputy editor of Kyiv Post, the English language newspaper in, uh, in, in Ukraine, or in Kyiv. This is about a nation being born. Mutilated by years of misrule, impoverished by looting, it emerges slowly from the ruin. This process is massive, and we don't know how well this birth is going, is going to go, but it's happening now and here, in Kyiv, and it's both painful, and it's both painful, and it's awesome. The only place to truly feel the pain and grandeur of this national awakening is to stand right there on the Maidan. That was December of 2013, and that quote very much went viral uh, in both Facebook and other places. Um, Katya is a Russian speaker. Uh, and her colleague, Sonia Koshkina, who is another Russian speaker and another respected journalist, underwent very much a profound identity shift during the Maidan. For example, on 22nd December, uh, she posted the following on Facebook, and I, I've, it's my translation. More and more, I feel an internal need to speak Ukrainian. I stress an internal need. I guess this is my own personal revolution. P.S., and she continues in Russian. I haven't crossed the line yet, but I'm getting close, and that's a fact. Speaking Ukrainian is not necessarily the defining characteristic of being Ukrainian, but it's certainly an important att attribute. And in my opinion, Sonia's personal revolution is just what many in Ukraine, particularly in the central regions of the country, uh, experienced as a direct result of the Maidan. During the Maidan, we, we can talk about an identity revolution. Um, how am I doing for time? Okay. Okay, then I'm going to skip over a little bit more, a little less on the nationalism stuff. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that personal identity issue. I think it's important to, to, to mention here this idea of I defines we. Uh, and that's, that's a process that, we, um, uh, that is pretty unique to the Maidan. Um, I defines we is indicative of a, of a birth uh, process rather than simply an affirmation. When we talk about identity, for example, in developed countries or... We, we talked about identity a little bit in Canada uh, two days ago. Uh, people have a menu that they choose from. So you, are, you're, 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 you identify with being a profession. You identify with being a gender. You identify with being a particular um, uh, nationality or perhaps, perhaps uh, a, a identification with a particular passport. Um, in this particular case, we're talking about a very much an introspective process. And um, so... The Maidan that I experienced was characterized by large numbers of people soul-searching as to their individual self-identifications and values, and then having realized that the essence of I was surprisingly similar to the I of their neighbor, they came together as we. Um, in the Durkheimian sense, this solidarity transformed from mechanical, sort of a, a taken-for-granted we, to an organic solidarity. And although it wasn't founded on a division of labor, as Durkheim would have had us believe, it was rather on a reflexive process of commitment to a community of values, symbolized in national institutions and perhaps symbols and a desire to build a new state. Let's go on to the bourgeois dimension. To refer to the demonstrators who affected Ukraine's revolution as bourgeois may be somewhat controversial. Um, in socioeconomic terms, many of those who camped out on the Maidan during the winter months could more accurately be called actually Ukraine's underclass. Uh, and there's actually some, some, some fairly good uh, descriptions of, of, of people that were actually in the tents. Yeah? 
and, and camping out of uh, there, it would be difficult to call these people bourgeois or even petty bourgeois. Um, this is a very large, large number of unemployed people. Um, the value, however, the values that the Maidan as a social actor stood for and the economic and political reforms that its activists lobbied in the wake of the collapse of the Yanukovych regime approximated those generally associated with the bourgeoisie. So, self-reliance, highly limited government, entrepreneurial freedom, espousal of meritocracy. Indeed, it was this bourgeoisie that allowed its employees to leave their jobs to demonstrate on Independence Square during their working hours. And it was this bourgeoisie that financed much of the supply effort for Maidan and for the ensuing Russia-Ukraine war. It was this bourgeoisie that formed the heart of the Avtomaidan and very a very effective cavalry force of protesters who would picket the homes of regime representatives in their mid-range and upscale passenger vehicles. Their protest was a reaction to the neo-feudal authoritarian system that Yanukovych had instituted. Naturally, once given the chance, their alternative socioeconomic program approximated a classical bourgeois response to corrupt authoritarian rule. And here I'll, I'll provide a little bit of, of some uh, anecdotal stuff. Um, during the months following the, the regime change, I met several times informally with Pavlo Sharameta, who is a colleague of mine from Cave Mohila Business School. He was the first founding dean. The inter and at the time, he had been the interim government's minister of economic development. And his statement illustrates the economic preferences of the newly installed post-Maidan executive. Apparently, the IMF functionaries who had arrived in Kyiv to arrange bridge financing after the revolution were shocked. In their history of dealings with developing countries, they had never met with a government whose ministers were more liberal than the IMF. Than the IMF. In the context of the conversation, the word liberal could well have been replaced with libertarian. Um, because the intent was to communicate a desire for drastically limiting the regulatory powers of the state, which are seen to have led hi historically to massive corruption in Ukraine. So the bourgeois dream involves the creation of a state which guarantees a level playing field for entrepreneurs, one in which those with merit, talent, skills, drive, etc., are able to su achieve success. Ironically, this bourgeois ideology held dear by many Maidan activists contrasts sharply with the reality of the EU where social democratic corporatism is more prevalent, which goes again to my statement that this is more a revolution of dignity than a Euro Maidan. Um, the broadly term bourgeois view, sadly, was not missed only by Yanukovych. It was also missed by former his former presidential rival, Yulia Timoshenko. Her portrait was displayed prominently on the tree on Maidan, and her persona was definitely a symbol of anti-regime resistance. Um, however, when she was actually released and presented her sort of, I guess, pre-election program sitting in a wheelchair on the Maidan, uh, the worldview that she presented was very, very, very distant indeed from what the Maidan protesters were talking about. And I'll again take a, a, a quote from an English language observer. His name is Martin Nunn uh, from Facebook. How sad, how truly sad to watch Timoshenko trying so hard to rouse the crowd on Maidan whilst not knowing that the world that she knew has changed beyond all recognition. Sadly, she is now an out-of-date politician in a world that, just, that she does not understand. If she runs for the presidency, I think she will unlikely get past the first round. Better that she would just retire gracefully and write her memoirs, as there is no place in Ukrainian politics for her today. During her speech to the demonstrators, Timoshenko repeated several times that she was deeply saddened that she was unable to take part in the revolution, but that she now, now that she had been released, she would be a guarantor of the rights of the people, and that, quote, she would never let this happen again. The paradigm she was projecting was clearly pre-revolutionary. Ukrainians, after the Maidan, no longer believed that someone in government should be their protector. On the contrary, they showed in unquestionable terms that they would not tolerate being ruled, they would not tolerate backroom deals with Yanukovych on the 21st of February, we remember uh, Sotnik Parasyuk, and they wanted representative rule-based government. And they were willing and able to ensure that those in office govern in a way that was accountable to them. I apologize, I've, I've, I've gone further than my slides here. Um, I've talked a little bit about all this stuff and I, and I, I, I should go back to this, the statement of the marginalizations of the students. The last point here is the class cleavages re re reflecting uh, regional cleavages. And I think that's important, perhaps even more important than the Poroshenko, uh, excuse me, than the Temoshenko speech. Um, the statement is that, I'm 
yeah, thank you. <laughs> the statement is that the, um, the, uh, the bourgeois, if you like, mentality that I'm trying to, to, to get across to you, meaning, uh, or bourgeois values, the mentality is probably not the best to use in, a, in an academic setting, um, but the, the bourgeois values are of self-reliance, of rules-based government, of being, um, being represented by the in the state rather than being governed by the state, or something that are actually antithetical to um, this sort of proletarian neo-patrimonial East. And I think this is something that perhaps needs to be explored a little bit more because the, the class cleavages and the worldview cleavages very much sort of map onto uh, regional cleavages in, in Ukraine. And my final point, um, the postmodern dimension. Uh, what we see is the formation of new senses. And Ukraine's Maidan throughout its sort of active period of 94 days was not merely about protest. Nominally barricaded from the outside world, Independence Square became a place for intellectual exchange, for the formation of new senses, their discussion, acceptance, rejection, and popularization. It was a place where new paradigms were constructed, molded, and engendered in discourse, symbols, and other communicative ar artifacts. Amidst the protesters' tents, barricades, facing police lines, speeches from the stage, songs and poetry heard in unlikely places, and never-ending negotiations between the opposition party leaders and the regime, people's value systems changed. The terminology used in their conversations transformed. The symbols that they used to express themselves began to morph. The Maidan was a collective social actor that spoke in multiple voices, none of which was really in sync with any group within Kiev's political elite. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this discourse transformation and its instantiation in new cooperative practicism was the very name given to the protests, the revolution of dignity. Dignity is a concept that has its roots in the Western European Enlightenment and it's often viewed as an extension of the concept of individual rights. This is where I, I perhaps would, would have a discussion with Bodan Kordan today. Fundamental to the paradigm of Western liberal democracy, and indeed to the modern concept of sociopolitical project of the past four centuries of Western civilization, is this idea of the sanctity or the centrality of the individual. The concept of dignity as expressed on the Maidan was distinctly di different. The dignity of the Maidan, the word hidnist in Ukrainian is more emotionally charged than its equivalent in English, has a cooperative concept, a notion implying mutual aid obligations, uh, mutual trust, mutual respect. I was struck by the, well, in contrast, dignity is a concept that can only be actualized through active relational interdependence, in contrast to individualism. In order to have dignity, an individual must be recognized as having it by another. Thus, dignity requires more than an individualistic conception of the subject. Dignity is, also, is only possible within a collectivity of persons, a concept close to the still underdeveloped strand of philosophy called personalism. Uh, personalism, if you'd like a, 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 a definition, by Wilson in 2009, not Andrew Wilson, different Wilson. Uh, personalism emphasizes the significance and uniqueness and inviolability of the person, as well as the person's essential relational or communitarian dimension. Anglo-American liberal democracy is antithetical to personalism. As the late Pope John Paul II, never tired of pointing out, its philosophical basis, the philosophical basis of Anglo-American democracy is the individual, a being with inalienable rights. Um, and individual responsibilities. Paradigmatically, it's the individual who has become the central actor of modernity of a consumerist industrial society. But this individual, writ large, stands in sharp contrast to the person of the Maidan, who declares his or her individual rights, but simultaneously recognizes collective responsibility, i.e. a duty to help, defend, feed, and sacrifice for others, incidentally, not only despite the, sta the state, but very often in spite of the state. Neo no individualist, or collectivist for that matter, would ever become a volunteer during the post-Maidan Russian-Ukrainian war, sacrificing career, family, and health to supply a ragtag army because the state was incapable of doing so. If I were to generalize, the ideas are admittedly somewhat rare. Ukrainians' post-Maidan values complexes seem to represent a strange mix of Western individualism with respect to rights and Slavic collectivism with respect to the need for recognition of those rights. Uh, Kurkov, uh, several days ago, argued that this is, this is very much sort of a, a reflection of this, this anarchist, um, if you like, uh, tradition that comes back from the, from, from the days of Mahno's army. Um, 
final point that I'd like to make with respect to this postmodern dimension is this notion of spravedlivist. As in the case with dignity, the Ukrainian word spravedlivist trans translates poorly into English. The direct translation is justice, but in English this term has a legalistic connotation. Justice is best achieved with the intervention of an impartial judge, and impartiality is best secured when one can benefit from the rule of law. In Ukrainian, there are two possible translations of the term rule of law. One is verkhovenstvo zakonu, which means that you are ruled by statute law. And the other is verkhovenstvo prava. And verkhovenstvo prava would mean, I guess, rule of natural law, right? This idea of, of, of not necessarily rule by morality, if you like. Yeah? During the original parliamentary debates that led to the adoption of the Constitution in 1996, the formulation of the article declaring the country to be a rule of law state was hotly debated, and eventually the phrase verkhovenstvo prava was adopted. I've, I've written about this elsewhere. Um, I really do need to finish, and I will finish. The fine, uh, what, perhaps this is something that we can talk about in the discussion, but I think one of the aspects, again, of the postmodern dimension of the Maidan is this idea of leaderless agency. Uh, we normally expect, and as a business school professor, I see this all the time, uh, management involves leadership. Well, in the Maidan, it didn't. Uh, you simply built barricades. Barricades were constructed. No one told you where they would, it, it's amazing. You can build a barricade without a project manager. That's, that's, that's surprising. Um, you can do this because the charisma is depersonalized. The idea of the idea becoming charismatic uh, is, is something new that I think that we as social scientists still need to get our heads around. My final slide has to do with counter-revolution and the future. Um, in the 18th century, the founding fathers of the United States made a claim that must have seemed outrageous to the elites of Europe at the time. They claimed their model of sociopolitical organization to be a, a, a model for the world and a sort of a beacon on the hilltop. They claimed their model, uh, excuse me, uh, for a Europe that had lived under absolute monarchy for hundreds of years, such a claim would have seemed unbelievable, possibly frightening, but more likely laughable. Similar results, reactions will be forthcoming to my claim that the Maidan and Ukraine more broadly may be a harbinger for a future sociopolitical program that may yet become an example for the civilized world. But unfortunately, as with many revolutions, there is a counter-revolution happening. So before that beacon on the hill becomes realized, um, there's a problem. Again from Katya Horchinska. In a way, this is a war. It is a war for a new civilization in Ukraine, based on values such as solidarity, dignity, respect for an individual, and clear and equal rights of the game for all. This is no longer about Europe or integration. It's about who we are and where we want to go. If we map our three levels of, or three dimensions of uh, Maidan onto what's going on today, I'd like to end with a, a, a sort of a proposition. What's going on at the moment in Ukraine is a, is a counter-revolutionary reaction. And as with uh, the revolution, it also has three dimensions. So the reaction to, that we see as Russia's invasion of Ukraine is an attack on the viability of Ukraine as a nation. So that is the answer of the counter-revolutionaries to the first dimension being the national dimension. The second thing that we have is we, we, we call it in, in, in Ukraine, we call this the war against the hydra. Now we, the reason we use hydra is because a hydra is a kind of an animal that when you chop off one, one head, another one appears. Corruption is like that. Um, we see this as the continuing battle against corruption and remnants of the ancien regime. Um, uh, Taras was very good today at talking about uh, the, this idea of, of criminality. Uh, criminality, as we know from, from the literature, there's a, a, a fellow by the name of Vadim Volkov who wrote about this concept of violent entrepreneurship in the 90s and the 2000s and the fusion of criminality and politics in St. Petersburg. Certainly we see this same kind of a process happening in the Donbass and I'm very pleased that Taras is going to be documenting it. Um, because I think it's worth documenting in the Ukrainian case, because it did not become, the mafia boss did not, did not be, or perhaps became the president, but was then overthrown, unlike in Ukraine. Oh, excuse me, unlike in, 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 yeah. But this idea of the war against the Hydra is very much a bourgeois reaction to the neo-feudalism um, account of, of, of what happened under Yanukovych. And finally, Russia's war with the West. Um, I, 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 I dare to point this out that um, there's a, there's a, a a joke going around in Ukraine at the moment that you know Putin is convinced that he's fighting against the United States. He said so in his Valtai speech. He said so several times, and the joke involves um, 
a Russian asking, oh, so how's the war with the U.S. going? Well, you know, we've started in the Donbass. So how's it going? Well, we've got a lot of, we've got, we've got thousands of casualties and it's a real problem. So how are the Americans doing? Well, they haven't shown up yet. Um, the, uh, the problem is that in, in that part of the world, uh, this is very much a clash of civilizations and it is seen as such. Um, I think that that term, clash of civilizations, clearly is very much loaded, and I'm not using it as a Huntingtonian sense, but nevertheless, that is one of the, one of the dimensions of, of that clash. And I think to, to end off, um, I'll say that this idea of the postmodern revolution, perhaps, perhaps, in the, in, the, in the clash of civilizations that is ongoing, where uh, the front lies somewhere between Donetsk and Dnipropetrovsk, uh, that is a, that in that area and perhaps in those lines is really a place where new senses are being formed and as we know from history very often in these peripheral areas, in these frontal areas, it's very often um, where, where new civilizational jumps are, are, are made historically. Um, that makes me very optimistic about the future of Ukraine and I hope I've been able to impart that optimism on you as well. Thanks for time.